It's Tuesday, January 24th, 2012. I'm Rim. I'm Ska. And this is Geek Nights. Tonight, a strategy guides for your games. Let's do this. It's me and Mario. I feel like I should have gone to a convention. It's the opposite of convention season until yeah. March, April. Till PAX. Yeah, pretty much. Pretty much we're just waiting on PAX at this point. And Anime Boston, which is actually the same time. Good job. Well, what do you mean good job? There's really no way around that. It's the only holiday weekend in that general vicinity. I'm just saying. Good job, guys. Yeah, I foresee neither of them moving. No, the, the, we already know neither one's moving. Yeah. I mean, that's no, no, I mean this year, but I'm saying in the future years, Anime Boston traditionally is always on. Of course, I think they Anime Boston published like the next 10 years or so of ABs. So maybe just look at that. Yep. Anyway. Are you, looking, are you looking at it? No. Oh, I thought you were looking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, say, I'm waiting for you to say something. Uh, so in other news, guess what? Guess what? New York Giants. Yeah. Aw, shit. <laughs> and, you know, I just want, you know, okay. They don't have to win. It'll be all right. You know, we won in 07. I can live off that for a long time. Well, I I, I want to say that I think they have a chance of winning. They Actually, that's the, that's scaring me because in 07, I go in, I'm like, they can't win this game. It's impossible. And then they won. It was like, holy shit. Are you kidding me? We actually, my and company. And then this year, it's like, oh, actually, they look like the best team because they suddenly got really good when everyone was no longer injured. My company is working on contingency plans in case parades. we can't get into the office due to parades and shenanigans. Uh, yeah, here's a contingency plan. Go to parade. Yeah. Enjoy parade. <laughs> Wait for parade to finish. Eat lunch. Then go to work. Oh, I will go to the parade, but my ops guys have to at least, you know, monitor the production system. From their phones while watching the parade. <laughs> anyway, uh, I do want to point out, though, you know, I'm going on the Twitters, and, you know, ha a lot of the people I follow on Twitter are, Sam, you know, uh, Silicon Valley nerds. They were all like, 49ers, woo, that's, uh, that's understandable. But there is an equally large number of people I'm following, and also just people in general, nerdy people, are like, sports, bleh. We've talked about that, how we have sports talked about nerd it. is no different from gamer we nerd. We have talked about it before, but I thought that it just bears repeating, considering we're two weeks away from the superb owl. The bears, the bears, the, the bears, bears, the bears. Sucked the bears sucked ass and didn't make the playoffs. And the they bears. Don't even... You said that, bears repeating. Sure. That you should not be disrespecting the sports. Sports is good. Well, These I know sports why. sports versus nerdery... This combat needs to end. Well, we know why it happens because look at most schools, like middle school, high school. The uh, nerdier, smarter kids tend to take band as opposed to gym, and in many school districts, they're mutually exclusive, which is one of the first well, big. Also, segregators. people who tend, you know, to be better at the brain activities tend to not be as good as the arm and leg. I activities. would actually disagree on that front. No, uh, you know, you look. Most and of the people I know, Scott, who are nerds or geeks, who are like really anti-sport and are really physically unfit. Not that bright either. Yeah, Nerdy I'm, interest does not mean smart. Well, no, I'm just saying you'll go to the high schools, right? Show me the high school where the nerdiest kid is also the quarterback of the football team so and Scott, the homecoming. The quarterback of my uh, the quarterback of my high school's football team was also the homecoming king. And he skipped football games to go to the band stuff because he was also in the marching band. All right. Yeah. No, anyone in my school, I mean, they were smart people Scott, we, who also played sports. We've talked about that, too. I went to kind but of a weird school the where, smartest people. like, the band was the popular kids, and generally, like, the football players were kind of like, eh, who are they? Like, it was a weird yeah. school. Show me, the, show me the kid who's, like, the nerd sitting in the back of the class playing Pokemans and then is also pick first in gym class. Well, here's I'm the, sure that Scott, guy exists. Here's my argument as to why that is the case. Gym class in the majority of schools in America barely involves physical activity and is basically just bullshit. My if gym, gym class always involved physical activity. Yeah, what kind of physical activity? All kinds. Like what? Most gym classes that I've seen... Playing sports? Yeah, most running. gym classes that I've seen that people talk about, especially if it's not a specific gym class. Like, I took tennis, and that was tennis. That was pretty good. But, like, general phys ed in middle school and elementary school is... Structure comes out, 
throws some balls out, says play dodgeball, and then goes to his office to jerk off or sleep or whatever. Dodgeball we played and is a physical activity. Yeah, with very poorly defined rules usually and people We had excellently and... defined rules and no cheating. I know, I'm saying that's and usually not the, the case. the gym person did not go back and jerk off in their office. They were refereeing quite excellently. And Scott, what I'm saying is that is atypical of the average gym experience. Anyway. Partly because gym teachers aren't paid that well and... You got off topic. The yeah. point is... All you guys in Green Bay, you suck? Well, it's simple. Uh, <laughs> New Orleans, you suck? One's understanding of Thaco. Jets, or for Eagles, example, you suck the most? Or for example, whether or not it is Tanari or the other kind of demon that is, you know, the opposite of immune to cold, rot, steel, or iron, or whatever BS cold you care Cold iron about. gets the demons, not the devils. You sure? I'm pretty sure. Are you sure? I'm not 100% sure, but I'm pretty sure that it works against demons, but not devils. I was trying to make a flaw. Anyway, so <laughs> that level of knowledge is literally no different than the guy who knows the batting averages of the 1978, uh, I was going to say Jets, just to see if anyone even noticed among our listenership. But sure. <laughs> Stop disrespecting sports. Instead, maybe you should go now watch Now you're allowed some. to disrespect baseball because it's boring as fuck. You should go research some and learn about it maybe. And then yeah. maybe, you know, you won't, because basically you're calling the kettle black, right? Some sports guy is like, oh, that nerdy bullshit, blah, blah, blah. It's like, well, you're being the same thing. You both, you know, stop hating the other guy's geekery. No, and no, no, no. You should I, instead learn about more geekeries. That is what we preach. I'm a hater on at soccer. At the Geek Nights. But I hate on soccer in the same way that I hate on particular video games like right. Team Fortress 2. It's only, you know, I'm not going to dis, you know, it's like, it's it's one of those things where it's like people get down on a category. They'd be like, anime sucks or manga sucks. Whereas like, if I'm hating on soccer, that's a specific sport. I am not down on sport. But it seems like a lot of nerds will be down on sport in general. But if you were to say, be down on fantasy, they would go nuts and be like, you can't just draw an entire category. It's like, well, you're throwing out sport. It's like, you know, learn about some, maybe. Plus, you know, not not to cast any dispersions, but there's the stereotype of the fat, sad nerd who can't uh, get any action on the opposite sex or the same sex, depending on their preference. Yeah. Uh, maybe if you moved around a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. Ex you should enjoy more geekeries, not less. Sport is a geekery. The idea Pick of, one. Also, think of this. The least. idea of the classical education. You know, you have to be of sound mind and sound body. Yep. Anyway. And sound body doesn't mean it makes a sound when you walk. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I got the do sex. I'm playing the do sex. You know what? You like to do sex? The do I like sex to do sex also. It's pretty fucking great. I wish great. I could do sex every day. In fact, uh, most people wish that. I've decided that Except my, Unix. my favorite thing in the world in the do sex is to tap a guy the on the sex shoulder part? and then cold cock him in the jaw with my metal motherfucking arm. Uh, so you're a rapist? Dave's X Human Revolution. Scott's gonna be down on it. He hasn't played it. He's he's gonna talk about how much it sucks. He's so uninterested. I've but never guys, played seriously. it, so I don't know if it sucks. But I really did not like the first one. It is it is super one fun, and I did not like the first Deus Ex that much either. But I am really enjoying the new Deus Ex, probably because I only paid fifteen dollars for it. That's a good price. Yeah, it it is maybe. Here's I'd why. Pay five bucks. Here's why this game is fun. This is there is a my free geek demo? Bite. No, I don't know. Dude, Scott, it's $15. That's a lot of money. I spend more than that on lunch every day. I spent a lot less than that, and I actually had two lunches today. I got a pizza and a pasta. Oh. And that was still less than $15. Oh. You know where I went? There's a Japanese bakery right by me. Okay. So I got a, a hot dog with like... A hot dog and a bun? Uh, no, it was a hot dog and a croissant. Okay. With like ketchup and some other weird stuff on it. Was it like one of those ones where the hot dog is cold? Yes. No, uh, I don't like that. I like stuff like that. I don't like that. And I got a uh, a custard coronet, which is basically a coronet of pastry filled with custard. Uh, yes. Like Pinkie Pie levels of custard. It was so kinda... I researched how to make, uh, you know, pastry cream. Oh. And then I was like, well, I can, you know, it's actually kind of hard to make just, you know, on in your house. Yes, it is. It requires many steps. But I'm like, well, it requires many steps, but I could do it. The thing is, then it's like, well, what the fuck can you do with pastry cream besides just eat it straight up? Just eat it straight up. The only, the only thing that I could find to do with it is basically put it into buns and make puffs. Like oh. basically homemade beard papa. But the so, thing is, you need to buy the puffs somewhere. So I'm sad not to baking say puffs. that... Fresh direct. I was like, I wonder if I can just buy pastry cream. No, I can't. No. I can get whipped cream, but can that's not the same thing. Can you get beard papas? 
Or oh cream my pops. god, I want a beard papa. You know what I hate in Japan? I went to beard fucking papas. That's right. Oh my god, I forgot how much I love them. That's good shit. So I'm just saying we can make those. We just so to- anyway. It's funny we got on a tangent about food because the reason I bought Deus Ex and played it now instead of waiting it for it to be a dollar was that Dave Riley and Joel White went nuts about this game. And pretty much everything I have to say about the game can be summed up by listening to Dave uh, Riley say what he thought about the game. Great. Because I enjoy it for the same reasons with one additional thing. You know why I'm enjoying this game so much? You know, you know, it's Deus Ex, so you like level up your stuff. Like I'm gonna level up. You walk up my- around and shoot things. Uh, actually, no, I don't really shoot things so much. I mostly do the stealth and the. Hack. Does the stealth actually work? Because in yes. the first one, the stealth doesn't work. The stealth works. The- only game, the only game I've ever played in my life, you know, there are a lot of games out there that say they're stealth games. The only game I've ever played in my life where the stealth actually works and is actually stealth is Thief and the other Thief games. In this game, the stealth actually works. In fact, the stealth is modified by a lot of stuff. Like in one mission, you have to bust into the police station and like steal something out of the skull of a guy you shot earlier. Okay. He's in the morgue and it's sure. all on lockdown. So... Let me count the ways you can approach this. One, you can just fucking break in through the roof and, like, sneak around the police station, don't get caught, maybe tase a couple of guys, cold cock them in the face, bust in, steal the thing, get out. And the stealth works great. Or you can convince the guy in the front desk to let you in, in which case the people walking around don't immediately go, hey, what the fuck, and, like, attack you because you're kind of supposed to be there, like someone let you in. But they're wary of you. They kind of watch you. So they're just kind of, like, walking around, like, kind of looking at you. And if you do anything weird, they walk over like, hey, what are you doing trying to climb into that grate there? <laughs> What's up? Maybe you should leave. And if you just try to like hack a computer and they see you, they're like, oh, what the fuck is this? And they shoot you. Okay. <laughs> so it, it actually works pretty intelligently. The, the line of sight and like the hiding and everything is pretty spot on. Like guys, if they could have seen you, they can see you. Like if you're you like you peek up and a guy's looking right at you, he just sees you. But if he wasn't looking right at you, he doesn't see you if you just peek up. Mm. But the w- the reason and the way I'm enjoying this game is that I decided that what I want to do is play the major Kusanagi from Ghost in the Shell. So I'm only leveling up things and doing things that she would do. And as a result, I've basically turned the character into the major. And I'm jumping off of buildings, landing behind a guy, cold cocking him, turning invisible, and then shooting people. Okay, great. It's great. Sure. The game is awesome. Don't listen to Scott. You should all play it. I don't know. I just haven't played this game, so I don't know. But yeah. I'm just extremely skeptical of a game that is a sequel to a game that was extremely overhyped and reviewed like, oh my God, a billion hundred stars, greatest ever, and is kind of sucky. So if there's a sequel to that game, I'm going to be extremely skeptical that it is any good. Also, the game is basically RoboCop. That's the plot. And in fact, I bust into this police station and there's a guy talking to another guy. He's like, yeah, I saw this movie about a guy. I'll buy that for a dollar. I saw this movie about a guy who got shot and he was a cop. And then they made him into some kind of like RoboCop. I don't remember what the movie was called, but Yo Dog, it's set in Detroit. And the other cop's like, yeah, I guess I haven't seen it. I don't know. Okay. (laughs) Then I tased both of them and hacked their computers and read their email. All right. So in other gaming news, right, there's a game that was released on GOG.com recently that Too Much Fanfare, you know, they put out a lot of games. Too Much Fanfare or Too Much Fanfare? Too Much. Both. Okay. Uh, called Syndicate. And Syndicate- Oh I, my God, fuck that game. I had never heard of this game. Really? No, hold on. You, you, you let me finish what okay, I'm saying. Okay, because already, really, it's like, yeah, You didn't Mario. let me finish what I'm saying. Okay. I had never heard of this game until at RIT- Alex was like some game he remembered from some time. Wait a minute. So my really that you didn't hear about the game until RIT stands. All right. But, you know, it was like he was Alex was trying to remember some game and he could never remember it. And then eventually he remembered it was Syndicate. And everyone was and some people were like, oh, yeah, that game. And that was that. And I just, you know, and the game, had again, been well, you know, people. It was one of those games that was remembered as being awesome and old. So I have a question for you. Did you play it? So because if you, I, I just want to ask you a pointed question, then you can tell your story. So I went was on GOG.com. Completely incomprehensible. You didn't know what to do. So I went on GOG.com. Your guy just the stood game, there. The game came out and it was really, uh, you know, popular and you know it was such a heralded old game. I'm like, I should, you know, I should know this game. So I, I paid what six bucks for it, right? And I got it. I started playing it, and it kind of worked. Yeah. And it was sort of XCOMish. Sort of, right? but it's real time. But it's real time. And 
It was actually, first I sort of died immediately. I was like, what the hell just happened? Because your guy's kind of standing there and someone shoots at him. He doesn't do anything. And then your other right. guy Right, so off. then I went on the internet and I looked at the controls because they don't give you any instructions. That's the big problem. So I was like, oh, right click on guys to shoot them. Why didn't you tell me? So then I was killing everyone, like, doo-doo-doo, because I just gave everyone shotguns. But half those people are civilians. I went, no. I just went in with shotguns. I was like, boom, dead, boom, boom. Who I was, were you shooting? Because most of the guys? people in most missions are civilians. These are all bad guys. They're all shooting at me. They're all guards in my mission was to assassinate somebody oh so i just went in with the shotguns so was like boom 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 right but there's one major flaw in this game uh-huh when you go inside a building you can't see in the building uh, yep. and i went to online like oh how do i see inside the buildings you can't and it's like i went in this building and like the building had like some sort of conveyor belt or something because all my guys kept walking in a circle in the building and i couldn't get them out and there was a bad guy in the building who shot all my guys and i was like what the fuck in that game, because the, the mm -hmm. actual game is actually pretty incomprehensible and difficult to control. The other thing I read in the instructions is that like, there's these three stats you control on your guys. With the drugs? That yeah, that changes how they behave. Yeah, it, it's kind of like the uh, blasters in X Wing, where you gotta like, like you can scale them back and make your guys suck, but then you build up kind of a laser. Yeah, so charge. I read all about that, but I didn't really need it for the first mission because in the first mission I could just right click and shoot everyone. Yep. But two of my guys died, and I was like, "Fuck! I spent all my money." Did you figure out those, how to get more guys? Giving those guys. Well, I had some extra guys, you can but just you can only guys. send four on a mission. But yes, the, the point is. It, I had six, two died, so I was still good. But to me, the game had the RTS problem of I've got four guys. The only strategy I ever had in that game was select all four and always attack only one. Exactly. But it's like I went in with four guys, two died, I had to buy two more. I just put cybernetic implants in two of those guys. All gone. And now they're gone. So, so it's like I, I learned immediately on the first mission. First of all, I started the game over because there's only one mission in. Yep. But it's like, never give everyone cybernetic implants. No bother researching them. Just research weapons and equipment. No, you need the cybernetic implants. But it, they're gonna, everyone's going to die, and I'm just going to lose all that money. So until I'm getting big income, don't buy it. In any. that game, I get bored. Because I didn't need, I, didn't, I gave everyone cyber legs thinking they would move fast, and it, it worked. But they still died. Some of them, not all of them. So the strategy so I I'm had. I'm not gonna waste money upgrading everyone on like the you know mission where I don't need it. One, you know how you can use that thing to get like civilians just to like follow you and help out. I didn't get past like the second mission. Oh, I'd walk around maps where there's civilians, just gathering like an army of civilians and just use them as cannon fodder. Oh. And then I'd bring them all back with me or whatever. But two, I would. Get nothing but Gatling guns and give everybody Gatling guns. Yeah, I, I didn't even have, you know, you know, I only started it, so I didn't have Gatling guns. I had shotguns, and I gave everyone a scanner and a med kit and, you know, whatever, a pistol and whatever else you can get. But I was, then I started researching automatic weapons, and I was like, well, how much should I spend on research? I don't even fucking know. So I just spent until it looked like there the was a good cost-benefit ratio. is about as unforgiving as Age of Steam, so <laughs> take that as you will. Yeah, it's pretty uh, It's another one of those things like XCOM where you need to take this core concept and just bring it into the modern era. Well, the, I think this is something I've noticed about GOG.com is that when someone's making a remake of a game and someone is making a Syndicate remake, uh, I'm not sure if it's going to be anything like the original, but it, you know, it'll be the same universe and the same, the word Syndicate will be in the title, right? Uh, is that what they tend to do is they'll tend to take the old version and put it on GOG.com and then come out with the remake. So it's like, let's remake XCOM and put the old XCOM on GOG. You know, that's what they tend to do. Man, if only, you know, other media people would do the exact same thing. I mean, when RoboCop was popular again, why didn't someone just like immediately re-release RoboCop on Blu-ray? Yeah, well, it's like, hey, if you're going to make a RoboCop remake, uh, you know, like they made a Clash of the Titans remake, right? And now they're Why wasn't the old one? And now they're, like this big now they're making a sequel to the remake. They should have, at the same time, just put the old one out there on like Netflix and every streaming service and maybe sell it for like a dollar on iTunes or any downloady places and just been like, this way everyone will see the old one. You know, like it'll just get the most exposure and basically we'll use the old one as number one, you'll profit by making some money off the old one because you get paid for those watches on Netflix and for those one dollar downloads and whatever. Yep, yep. And it's basically just advertising the new one, but no one does that. They're still, you know, they keep the old one close to the chest and try to sell it for 15 bucks. It's like, what the fuck? So, remember, I was playing a Binding of Isaac, and it's fun, but it's the kind of game where I really want to play it on, like, my DS. Like, it's not a game I would just sit down and play as my primary activity yeah. in my house. I played a little bit, and then I stopped. Thing is, it looks like Zelda. It's not really Zelda, and it looks like Robotron. But really, at its core, it's NetHack. 
Well, it has shooting, so it's more like Doom R. <laughs> it's more like NetHack, though. Or like or like uh, Dragon Crystal or all those NetHack-ish roguelike kind of games. In terms of like the flow... You mean, rogue- you mean roguelike games. And the items and how the items are incomprehensible. You kind of have to use them to figure them out. And every run is a unique run and you know, all that stuff. Mm. But uh, there was the bullshit that when I bought the game and I clicked on it to set up my gamepad. And it had gamepad as an option. When I selected gamepad, it said, download joy to key Well, Bobo said the same thing. Uh, that's what I was getting at here. So... A Bobo and Binding of Isaac did not have gamepad support. A Bobo, I kind of understand because it was a Flash game. Whatever. I didn't know it was going to be a Flash game. I was disappointed. I thought it was going to be a downloading game. But the fact that Joey 2 Key is their answer to this, seriously, Joey 2 Key looks like... Now, I know that the actual Joey 2 Key, if you get the legitimate version, does not appear to be malware or anything. It's fine. But good God, fun. does it have all the trappings of malware. And good God, do not half of the places I found that claim to have a download of it pretty much straight up put malware in it. So to all you gamers who independently have computer problems, it's because you download shit like that that you have computer problems. That's right. I'm not saying joy to key is bad. I am saying you are bad as a person if you trust something that looks like joy to key. Yep. Ne- I would never install Joy Key on anything. I don't trust that shit. At least a Bobo linked directly to a download of the binary executable for Joy Key, as opposed to Binary of Isaac, which was like, yeah, How can you trust it. that link, though? I trust it slightly more. Slightly, but not much more. Right? I want to see... I would trust it if it was like, you know, an open source project or something, but it's like, still... Don't make me use a separate thing like that. Freaking include the joystick support. It's not fucking hard. Do it. Good and God. also, you know, gamers out there, yeah, Binding of Isaac is a fine game. It has this flaw, but it's otherwise a good game. Don't defend that flaw as a feature by saying something to me like, and I'm paraphrasing someone who actually said this to me, but the game really is better suited to being played on the keyboard. And no, fuck you. <laughs> What's wrong with you? That that'd be like if Google murdered a thousand puppies. You was like, yeah, well, you know, it's a lot better to do. It it's a lot better Google's- to do Google searches with your tongue than with the keyboard. Let me tell you, it's really best suited to the tongue interface. That wouldn't be a bad interface. Uh, it depends. Depends. Uh, go ask someone who has to use their tongue because they have some, you know, disability of some sort, so- and ask ask them if they'd rather use a keyboard or their tongue. So did you play a Bobo? I played level one of a Bobo, and then I died in level two, and then I didn't play it again. Really? I pretty much beat it in one go. It's actually super easy. Uh, I got electrocuted by the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle water electrocuted bits. So briefly, a Bobo, now that I've played it all the way through, is a great one-shot experience. It is a beautiful homage to NES gaming. It is very cleverly done homage. There are so many tiny little touches, and who the square boss is at the end is priceless. Mm -hmm. Absolutely priceless. However, many people have said things to the effect of, yes, it's an homage to Nintendo hard games. It is not Nintendo hard. But it gives a simulacrum of Nintendo hard. Like, it has all the trappings of a Nintendo hard game, but without the actual Nintendo hard difficulty level. So someone who is not a hardcore, old-school gamer will play a Bobo, and understand what Nintendo Hard felt like without actually playing Ninja you Gaiden. Can't, no, you can't understand what Nintendo Hard feels like unless you play the same exact level over a hundred times using all your lives and all your continues only to be sent back to the beginning of the game and then try it again every single day when you come home from school for a whole month. Yeah, but And then beat the level only once and then once you get to the next level, it's so much harder, you die instantly. And then you don't even know what to do. That is that the true experience. That experience is not available to modern kids except for those who are very dedicated to That's gaming. what I'm saying. It is available. You can just do it. You just, the thing is, you have to do it. It has to be in... You have, you yes, know, but you know what? Can I, you do it, or will you be distracted and go play Angry Birds? Scott, I don't fault any kid for not doing it today, because the only reason I did it back then is because that was it. I think you should force yourself to do it at least once. And in fact, I can recommend a... Uh, Ninja Gaiden. Mm, that's a good one. Hell, but- Mario 3. Beat Mario 3 without warp whistles. <laughs> I've never actually done it. Yeah. There was a game. Well, I've done it with save states, but that's not really Nintendo. Well, what the hell anymore. is the name of that game? But Abobo is super fun and awesome, but 
I was personally disappointed for the same reasons I was disappointed by Team Fortress 2. It was such a great game, a Bobo, but it wasn't actually like, like I expected. I sat down like this is going to be the hardest fucking thing ever. Oh my God, I'm going to play this game and I'm going to beat it no matter what. Then I beat it like in an hour and I was like, oh, I guess there's no more a Bobo. If you want to get that experience, right, I would recommend playing Conquest of the Crystal Palace. Right? Fuck that game, no. Yeah, why no. not? You, do you even know what game that is? Actually, no, I'm thinking of Crystal Castle, so never mind. No. Conquest of the Crystal Palace was, it's an NES side scrolly platformy ish game, right? It's a lot simpler than Ninja Gaiden or Gay Den, right? You start the game, and there are like three crystal balls to choose from. Uh, like one's power, one's, you know, sort of like the beginning of, uh, what's it called? The Mickey Mouse game. Kingdom Hearts, where you can choose oh, to, yeah. you know, be the one of the three. And then you just sort of walk sideways and hit things uh, while platforming, a lot like most games of that day. But it's like, it's, you know, it's got that Nintendo hardness of Ninja Gaiden, but it's not impossible hardness, right? It's like, so you can get the experience but you'll still make progress. You will still actually get to the next level, and the bosses are just crazy awesome all over the place. Are they on the level of Mike Tyson's Punch-Out bosses? They're pretty hilarious, (laughs) (laughs) Uh, but not racist. (laughs) But anyway, things of the day. So, uh, sequelitis. Uh, Many people are fans of this, but if you are not, you will be now. Dude basically reviews. This you know, is my thing to today. Games. I was gonna use and I forgot to use. Mm. So, thief, thief. Yeah, Scott showed it to me. Burglar. Mega Man. Mega Man. Mega Man. Turd burglar. This is one of the most succinct, intelligent, well constructed explanations of, at its core, what I hate about most modern games and what I like about a lot of old games, and yep. what makes a game good, purely in the context of. Teaching the player what to do without forcing him to read a manual and without going, Mega Man, Mega Man, those blocks are going to fall. You'd better not step on them. Yep. I don't want to even say anything else other than you should watch this. And to be sure, to be clear, to be fair, I watched a bunch more of the sequelitis to make sure, you know, there's a chance someone might be a one trick pony. No, I pretty much agree with this guy on 99% of what he has to say. He is way smart, and I'm going to do everything I can to trick him into doing a panel at PAX if he's not already. All right. So, uh, I saw a link to this. I haven't played it yet, so it might suck, but I don't know. But I'm going to find out tonight when I get home. There's Scott, Scott, Scott! The game might suck! It might. You better watch out! But it's going to be a thing of the day anyway. Uh, there is a game. It is a free mod for the Half-Life 2. You should have Half-Life 2 Episode 2 if you want all the textures and such. Uh, called Elevator Source. Chase told you about this. No, I saw it on the internet. Oh, because Chase invited us to a a party where we're going to, as a group, play this game. Why play it as a group? Because <laughs> it'll be more fun. Eh, whatever. Elevator Source is a single or co-op. Oh, I guess or co-op. Elevator experience. Have that you is, looked at the game? Like, have you actually, like... That what? is different each time you play. What for, floor will you stop on next? What will happen? Who knows? We don't even know. And we made the game. It's that exciting. Up to 28 randomized floors to stop on with DLC packs in the future. Hopefully, they'll also be free. A thrilling co-op experience. Realistic elevator physics. Cunning state-of-the-art AI that really goes into the elevator and waits. <laughs> Real moral choices. What floor do you get off at? Do you ever get off? Only you are able to craft your elevator story i'm actually a big fan of the games that are sort of experiences i feel like this game is going to give me the same fun that we didn't play this this game did where it's really it's about the experience and the exploration and doing it with a bunch of friends and yelling yeah want to create your own elevator floors check out the sdk oh it's a mod for gary's mod does that mean i need gary's mod probably yes fuck just come to our party we're gonna play this game as a group Nah, not interested in the meta moment, the book club books are not one, but two books. It's going to be real soon, this book club. But the Maybe two... Thursday. Maybe. The books... Did you finish it? Yeah. Oh, let's do it Thursday. <laughs> the books you need to read are one, a little, The Little Prince, and two, Wind, Sand, and Stars, both of which are written by Antoine de Saint-Exupéry. I have a lot to say about both of these books. Uh, I read them both. Uh, I took notes. They're I am ready to one, rock. One of them is crazy short. One of them is relatively short. They're both the awesomeness. 
Uh, if you didn't read them both by now, I mean, it's, you've had enough time. Uh, I will say. Seriously? What the fuck? I was pleasantly surprised. When Sad and Stars, like, I expected a certain thing. And for most of the book, I got that. And then at the end, he went somewhere very different. And well, no, it wasn't really that different. No, no, thematically it wasn't. Actually, it kind of fit it into was exactly. It was exactly yes, the same. But I, thematically it was the same. But in terms of, I don't know, I did not expect that part of the story to be what it was. I'm obviously not spoiling anything. Well, maybe you should just save what you have to say for a show that we have to do instead of using all the material up and then not being able to... Re- I have plenty of material. I'm just saying. So, strategery. I think... When I think of strategy guys... Well, do we have any other meta first? Nah. Okay. Well, you know what? You want some meta? All right. Uh, Game of Thrones. That's I not made, meta moment. I made a mashup of Chunk from the Goonies and Tyrion from Game of Thrones, and Scott hasn't seen Game of Thrones. He doesn't know, but you should all watch Game of Thrones because it's basically a series of failed burning wheel rolls. All right. So... Uh, if that's all the meta you got, then you don't got none. So I think when I think strategy guide, there's really, there are two and only two. And these two strategy guides kind of epitomize everything that I think a strategy guide should be. And also why I hate pretty much all strategy guides. <laughs> this, these are that Super Mario Brothers, like, awesome book. Of the Mario all- 3 one that was on, like, cardstock. That was the one I had. That was the best. Unbelievable book. Well, it had so much like I should try to buy it on eBay. And aside, I have two copies. Uh. And asides, <laughs> and one's in mint condition, and one was read to fucking death. I, mine was destroyed. In fact, I have all four of the original uh, Nintendo. Oh Power my god! Here we guys. go. Lot of four, right? Four player extra Final Fantasy Mario three and something else. Four Nintendo Power Strategy guides. Final Fantasy Mario three. Oh, Ninja Gaiden two, uh, and these are going on eBay for twenty bucks. Okay, I I own multiple copies of all of them. Yeah. Anyway, the other one that really springs to mind as being like the the idea of what these should all strive to be is that Final Fantasy one one. Because let me tell you, it was pretty much as enjoyable to read that entire guide as it actually would be to play the stupid game. Yeah. So the thing with strategy, guys. First, I want to talk about it's like, is it cheating? Right. It's like you get this book. Uh, you know what? I'm going to say something very simple. I'm going to head you off. If we're talking about single-player games... There is no cheating. There's no such thing. Unless you're cheating yourself. But that's not... That's a different kind of cheating. Who cares? Well, I mean, is it cheating? If I, if I buy a, word, uh, a, word, a crossword puzzle book, and I just look in the back and copy all the answers to the front of the book, right? It's not cheating. It's just sad. Yeah, it's like you're just cheating yourself out of the experience of solving the crossword puzzle. Or perhaps, for example, Final Fantasy One. By getting kind of this awesome, like very well put together explanation of everything that's going on, and kind of reading ahead and you know spoiling some things for yourself, you it, you could almost be enhancing the experience of the game. Well, in Final Fantasy One is the kind of game where you can fo- literally just follow instructions, and that will take you through the game, like the answer to a crossword puzzle. But for Mario Three, you might know where to go, you might know where all the secrets are, you might know you know all this stuff. But you actually, at some point, there aren't enough P-Wings and clouds. You actually have to do it. And if you use, say, a cloud and then a P-Wing and then you die or something like that, you might have to do something else that you Scott, didn't, uh, you clouded. Scott, never cloud, then P-Wing. Always P-Wing, then cloud. I'm just saying, <laughs> if you cloud some level and then you, you know, fuck it up, you might end up in a bad place and where you just wasted the cloud and the P-Wing and now you have to actually beat levels with your skills you know, the, the strategy guide isn't going to help your jump timing or your ability, you know, your your reflexes, which you will need to win. It's like I read a whole lot of strategy guides, especially fighting games. A fighting game, I think there's nothing wrong with the strategy guide, you know? Well, there, like, a strategy guide for a fighting game is basically just the real instruction exactly, book. Exactly, right? It's like in the olden days, the fighting games didn't really come with instruction books. It's like you maybe if you had the arcade cabinet, you would see it would list the special moves in a little square. And it wouldn't even give you all the special moves. It would only give you a few of them. And it wouldn't tell you any combos or anything. And But even if you had that, it's like I saw, I knew that a Hadouken was a quarter circle forward and a button press. I couldn't do one for the longest fucking time. I tried so much. And I just like swinging the stick back and forth and jamming the punch button. And maybe one would come out somewhere. It will not help you. It's just real instructions. <laughs> um... But in other games like Final Fantasy, the or you know especially a point and click text you know adventure game, 
The strategy guide is the game. You can just read the strategy guide and not play. But I think, like, the Final Fantasy 1 one, like, as an example, was just, it had so much good art and stuff in it. There was, like, all, it was kind of like an experience in and of itself. And I feel like the only strategy guides that I have a problem with are the ones that exist solely to make an otherwise unplayable game playable. Yeah, well, uh, and this isn't an unplayable game, but Ogre Battle 64 is a great game, actually. Uh, and But in the, it has all this crazy stuff that I haven't seen many other games have since. But my brother had that game and played it like crazy, and he had the strategy guide for Nintendo Power. At least I think it was Nintendo Power. And you'd go through the strategy guide and you'd see shit in there and you'd be like, are you fucking kidding me? And the one that I remember specifically was the most powerful unit in the game was like this angel unit that you could get in your army. To get the angel unit, you had to get this. There's a clock and a calendar in the game, right? You had to go to a certain map, which is a very early map, an early map in the game. Go into it on a certain day on the in-game calendar at a certain time. Go to a certain house at that time and do a certain thing. There was no way to know that in the fucking universe without freaking reading that strategy guide. You cannot convince me that anyone in the history of the world who has played that game has ever figured out to do that and did it without looking it up in the strategy guide. Right? It's just impossible that you would know that. So it's like you could beat the game and you could have tons of fun with it, but there are a lot of things they put in that game that are just complete arbitrary bullshit that are in the game that is sealed by the... It's almost like the strategy guide was like a DLC. It's like, this stuff in the game already. It's unlocked DLC. It's already... We already gave it to you. But even though it's unlocked, you won't know where to find it. It's the most hidden of hidden hiddens. So and the instructions not, on not, how to find that hidden, hidden, hidden cost 10 bucks. Do not strategy guides that serve that sole purpose and no other purpose... It also told you... No uh, longer have any sort of reasonable means of selling in light of the internet? Well, that's true. It, it did have real strategies in it, first of all, right, for the regular game. It just also had that... In yeah, it, but I mean, all that nowadays, all that stuff is on GameFAQs or something anyway. Exactly. Which so, is why I think the strategy game market has gone pretty downhill ever since GameFAQs came Now, the thing out. is... A the, lot less people are buying strategy guides. I never actually really used strategy guides to, like, learn about games that I played. I used them to explore games that I wasn't actually ever going to buy or play. Or games that, like, I rented once, and it was kind of fun, and then I didn't buy it. So what I do is, when Nintendo Power reviewed the game, I kind of live vicariously through Nintendo Power by, like, looking at all the crazy levels that were later I didn't yep. get to, and looking at what the ending is, and all the codes, and all the BS, and... It was very similar to now when I said that I pirated uh, Poker Night of the Inventory by watching all the cutscenes on YouTube. Yeah, I mean, back in those days, right, it's like now there's such an abundance of video games, you don't need to live a, vi a video game vicariously. And if you don't, if you do, because I've found a lot of people, like, I enjoy watching someone play some kinds of games 95% as much as I would just playing the games themselves. So that's why we have this popularity of, like, Dave and Joel live streaming stuff when they play, like, Fatal Frame or something. Yep. Or, you but know, you, the Let's Play. In the olden days, you had an NES and you didn't have a lot of money. You didn't buy every NES game for 50 bucks each. You only owned so many games and your friends only had so many games. And there are a lot of games you would never play or you'd never even heard of or, like, would never be in the store near you. And you would, you know, you'd go to the book fair in your elementary school and for five, ten bucks you would buy a strategy guide that had, you know, had a beat, like, you know, or at least tips and tricks for hard parts of, like, a bunch of different games. Do you have that one, the yellow paperback book that was just text that was, like, codes and tricks? And no, that? I had ones that had pictures in them. I had those, too. But a thing blue is, one and a red one. They were all... They were sort of thin, but they were big. Uh, I remember those, too. I remember as a kid, all the off-brand, like, non-Nintendo power were pretty much... Ghetto. Not only ghetto, but often wrong. Like, as a kid, I'd look at them and be like, that's not right. That code doesn't do anything. That's wrong. That's bullshit. Yeah. The Nintendo Power ones, they really put the extra effort, you know, into making it complete. Well, like I said, it was the polish. Like It told it showed you every pixel of every map. It told you what was in every mushroom house. It told you every bad guy you could see right there. It, you know, it showed everything. Every piece of information about it the entire game was in there. It let you explore the game. Because remember, there's the mechanical aspect of playing a game like Mario 3, but there's also the exploratory aspect. Like, when I was flipping through that guy... You were never going to go to those ice world levels with the fireball and burn your way into all those, you know, ice blocks to go in all those pipes to see what's in there. But when I saw 
Curry Bow's motherfucking shoe in that guy. I was like, what what is this? I had gotten the shoe before. Uh, I didn't get the to... shoe. I don't know why. I think I just ended up always skipping that level. No, see, I would go to, I would go because I would warp to level five because I didn't know the third whistle. I only needed two whistles. I was obsessed with World 4, the giant world, so I'd always go there just because it was crazy. Yeah, I would, you know, I, I, I just like the giant level. I never much. wouldn't, I, you know, that's a separate discussion. How was the kid? I often wouldn't even try to beat those games. Like, Have I would we just done like, a Mario 3 uh, show? I don't know. I would just kind of <laughs> dick around. Like, I'd go to World 4 because World 4 was fun and just play around. Then I'd go get Kuribo's shoe and then... I'd peter around and stuff on the pipe world till I got sick of it, and then I turned the Nintendo off. Mm -hmm. Anyway, because you couldn't be, because you suck. I've beaten Mario 3, but I've never beaten it without using at least one warp whistle. Well, you're allowed to use whistles. You're just not allowed to use uh, any cheating, like save states. Thing is, it's trivial to beat Mario 3 if you just, you know, use warp whistles. No, because you get the last level. They need to beat it. The last level is actually pretty easy. I have a lot of trouble with some of the levels leading up to it, which is why I need three P-Wings or I can't do it. <laughs> I've managed. I used to need P-Wings when I was a kid, but I need less P-Wings now than I used Though, to. Though, Scott, I will say this. As a kid, I really, like, beating the game was never really my goal. After I'd beaten the game a few times even, like I didn't care about beating the game. I cared about getting the Tanuki suit and the hammer suit and then using them it's as all, much as possible. I didn't even possible. know there was a hammer suit. Like, the hammer suit to me was one of those things that was like a rumor. Like, you know, oh my God, people get naked in, you know, these games. It was like one of those bullshit rumors that kids spread. I knew about the hammer suit. Right? And it was like... From Nintendo Power. Well, I'm just saying, it's like... You know, it's one of those things. Like, Pete, in those days, you couldn't get reliable information, and people would, kids would spread all kinds of misinformation for every game. Oh my God, you can get new you go to nudalities the, in Mortal Kombat 2. If you go to the top of that tower in Final Fantasy 6, or I guess 3 back then, and you walk around it like 7,000 times, then General Leo comes back from the dead. Yeah, if you will spread all kinds of shit. So. The idea of a hammer suit was just like, yeah, it's some made up bullshit. And then I got the strategy guide and it was like, there is a hammer suit. Here is where you get it. Here is what it does. And I was like, are you fucking kidding me? I was obsessed as a kid with getting all the weird power ups just to get them. And once I got them, I kind of wouldn't know what to do with myself. Like I'd never actually want to use them. <laughs> yeah, it's like I got the hammer suit. I do not want to lose this hammer suit. Because back then I had not yet seen Nausicaa Valley of the Wind. So first... I did not have my favorite quote. If not now, then when? Exactly. But then you get that hammer suit, you turn it on, and you throw a hammer at a thwomp, and oh it my God. kills him. You're like, oh, shit. When that happened, I literally got killed by a Podboros because I stopped. I was like, what? That's right. Hammers <laughs> kill thwomps. I, uh, the, the saddest thing was I'd lose the hammer suit almost right away. Even though if you crouched in it, you were almost invincible. I know, but I'd have to eventually stop crouching. <laughs> so start throwing hammers. But anyway, do, so do strategy guides have a place at all in the modern world or because look, the mechanical aspects of telling you every individual detail about a game is covered by the internet. Mm -hmm. The exploratory aspect of seeing the parts of the game you either couldn't get to, wouldn't get to, didn't care about, didn't own the game is also covered by the internet. Yep. And that's it. Yeah, I think in general, right? I mean, how I don't see like Good, well-designed strategy guide. Granted, I haven't gone to a GameStop in years. Well, even if you did, you would never even look at the strategy guides. You wouldn't even consider looking at them because they're completely unnecessary in the current day. You know, but in the olden days, they were very necessary. You couldn't get this information. You know, even just people would put codes in their games and then give the codes to magazines, and then the co magazines would use the fact that they had the codes in them as like a selling point. Except now they're on the internet already. Yep. And it's like, now, do games even really have codes anymore? <laughs> right? like, uh, a Bobo does. Yeah, I'm sure it does. But I was actually really disappointed in a Bobo that in the Zelda world, there were no secret doors or anything. I pushed every fucking block and bombed every fucking thing. There was nothing. Oh, good. Then I won't do it. <laughs> well, not bombs, but I did the, I assumed it'd be like second quest. Where you There's like no walk. bombs or candle action? There is something reminiscent of candle action, but it's not you. No. Oh. It's basically one dungeon. The only great thing is the shape of the dungeon, and then I guess what happens to your sword. Great. And what happens when you meet a man in a cave. <laughs> I got something. It's a secret to everybody. Pay me for the door <laughs> repair charge. <laughs> anyway. I'm still, to this day, I, have, I mean, I wore out between me and my little brother, the Final Fantasy One strategy guide, because we just read it. 
Like over and over again. Yeah, the I same read with the Mario Three one. The Mario had, Three one was destroyed. The other ones had a lot of games in them that I never played, like Princess Tomato and the Salad Kingdom. Oh my god, I played that game. Or what Monster? What was that game? Monster something. Oh, what the fuck was this game? What game? It was a game that like few people have actually played. I have no idea what you're talking Monster about. Party. Monster Party. There was a strategy guide for Monster Party, and I read that, and I was like, oh shit, are you kidding me? It was. It looked so cool, and it was actually. Playing those games now, you know, not necessarily as good, but the experience that I got, the idea I got of those games, reading the strategy guide for them and seeing all the parts of them was way better than actually playing them. Uh, yep. Wizards, oh my God. Wizards and Warriors, all of them. I read strategy oh guides. Oh my God, fucking Wizards and Warriors. That Wizards and Warriors all three of them was incomprehensible and impossible. Like that second one right? was even harder. With the elements yep. was so fun in the strategy guide because like, oh, he's fighting the fire boss. Oh, he's fighting the earth boss. But I actually, never got to any boss. Actually playing those games, impossible. Remember Wizards and Warriors 3 with different classes? Like you turn into the thief to walk by the giant and then you turn into the Yeah, whatever. impossible. Yeah. I couldn't figure out what was going on. Yep. In that game. Yep. And you couldn't save as far as I could tell. I remember I'd like like I started the game like Friday night and then I paused it when I went to bed, praying to all the gods that it would unpause in the morning. And there are other games that were just like you know, you know, the kind of games that people don't make anymore. Nowadays people make beatable games. And I'm not even talking about this kind of stuff I talked about with Ogre Battle, where the game has some secret you're never gonna find. It's just that the game, the instruction book just doesn't give you enough information. There's no map. There's just not enough to go on. Like Syndicate. <laughs> <laughs> right, there is not enough to go on to l to really get anywhere in the game without some more information, like Legacy of the Wizard or something like that. You know, it's like you need some help to be able to beat that game unless you just, you know, try everything and just make your own maps and go crazy and devote like your whole life to it. Oh my god, I remember Legacy of the Wizard. Where you you know you'd be walking and you'd see the awesome sword, but you couldn't get to it because it's underneath your feet in that little box, and the dragon would be there, but he'd be asleep, and you had to do a thing to get him to awaken, but only after you got the sword. And you can get to you have to go all the way back to the beginning of the game all the time to change between the different family members, and you would use like the little pet or the the you know the girl and the the kid who could jump, but the dad had the awesome weapon he could break shit and. So yeah. I'd recommend if you, you know, if you want to experience a little bit of what it was like. To be a kid in the 80s playing NES games. Get the Final Fantasy 1 strategy guide or the Mario 3 strategy guide. A game you ha Get a strategy guide for a game you haven't played. Or that you say. don't remember. Maybe you played a little, but you like, didn't get very far into it. Yeah. You'll, you'll be surprised how fun it is to kind of read all the crazy stuff. Because some of these NES games are actually a lot more complex than they would lead you to believe. Yeah, go on eBay, buy an old strategy guide. Don't buy some new one. right? Go buy the old strategy guide for something. Or play that uh, retro game master game on the game on the uh, DS. Yeah, that'll give you sort of a hint, but it's not you know that's, that's a, a simulacrum yeah. of the experience, much like a Bobo is a simulacrum of Nintendo Hard. Exactly. This has been Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for the opening music, Cat Lee for web design, and Brand OK for the logos. Be sure to visit our website at frontrowcrew.com for show notes, discussion, news, and more. Remember, Geek Nights is not one, but four different shows. SciTech Mondays, Gaming Tuesdays, Anime Comic Wednesdays, and Indiscriminate Thursdays. Geek Nights is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 license. Geek Nights is recorded live with no studio and no audience. But unlike those other late shows, it's actually recorded at night. <laughs>